management of uh, type 2 diabetes the initial parts is mainly by OHA. That's why I added this initial term. So I will, uh, I want to start with this saying by the famous Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, you might have heard this uh, in Sherlock Holmes. So there is nothing more deceptive than the obvious fact. This is the most appropriate statement that appears or very suitable when we choose an oral anti-diabetic agent. Okay, another thing which I want to correct here is the earlier time was OHA, that is oral hypoglycemic agent. The term has been replaced by OAD because all the OHAs may not cause hypoglycemia. That means all the diabetic drugs does not cause hypoglycemia. That's why they have changed the terminology from oral hypoglycemic agent to oral anti-diabetic agent. <laughs> so this is because we have got an armamentorium of the uh, oral anti-diabetic drugs nowadays. Earlier, a decade back, only three or two, three classes of drugs were in the major use. Now we have a many a number of classes. In each class, we have got many uh, drugs with the a variation from the same class, uh, like dapaglitrosin may be different from empaglitrosin like this. So in this arm armamentorium, it is getting difficult to choose uh, which agent is more appropriate uh, for my patient. This is getting difficult. Uh, day by day, because I will tell you what are the factors you need to be considered when you want to choose an ideal oral anti-IPK for your patient. So we know that insulin is not a disease with a straightforward a single pathophysiological mechanism. Earlier, it, it was thought that mainly three abnormalities uh, were appeared as a part of pathogenesis in the insulin. The abnormality was in the pancreas, the abnormality in the insulin, sorry, liver, and the abnormality in the skeletal muscle. So this was labeled as prime variates of diabetes. So the liver, the pancreas, and the skeletal muscles were considered as the major targets in the causation of the hyperglycemia in diabetes. But this has changed for the last decade into an ominous octet. Especially after the discovery of the incretins, uh, the pathogenesis has expanded a lot. Now there are at least eight abnormalities which have been found in the patient of diabetes. So mainly on the degrees of insulin reads, we have got glucagon into the picture now. The liver is abnormal earlier. We are getting involved with the uh, neurohumoral uh, mechanisms day by day. And we have got muscle abnormalities, we have got kidney abnormalities, and we have got adipose tissue basically and the intestines majority by their incretin effect. So now we want a drug which has to target all the mechanism of actions, uh, which is very difficult. We cannot cover all these mechanisms by a single agent. So we need to address uh, each mechanism when we treat the patients uh, by adding or by combining the drugs. So nowadays also the diabetes therapy from a single agent is moving towards an early combination therapy. This is because of this particular pathophysiological mechanism that is the ominous octet. And another reason for this early combination therapy is we know that due for the beta cell preservation. To preserve our beta cells, uh, we need to address the early combination therapy. So if you see the spectrum of OADs, we have got many class of drugs. We have got the uh, bigunates, sulfonylureas, the thazodinidions, the glynides, and the alpha-glucosidase inhibitors. These were the earlier classes of drugs, uh, the historical drugs. We will cover uh, these particular drugs in this particular class. Okay. Then we have got the uh, recent updates like the uh, incretin-based therapy partly by the DP4 inhibitors and the new SGLT2 inhibitors, the dopamine agonists, the anti may uh, mainly the hydroxychloroquine. Nowadays, we also have oral GLP-1 analogs. There are many other drugs like the mitochondrial modulators like an imiglimine, uh, which is nowadays uh, somewhat, I would call that, pushed by the pharma companies to involve this as the part of an oral anti-diabetic agent. But all the <coughs> associations are denying the fact that to add this as a particular 
for an anti-diabetic agent, but we don't know what will happen in the coming time. So whenever we choose an agent, we need to consider a few factors when starting on the OADs. Like whenever a patient comes to you with a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus, type 1, you leave it, it is simply insulin. Whereas if the patient is type 2, especially the proven type 2, the patient is not any hybrid forms. If you have a pure type 2, then you need to consider a few factors when you want to start OADs. So you should know the efficacy of the drug you should, you should be starting and the safety of the drug, the side effect of the drug, and this side effect profile is suitable for your particular patient or not. And what is its effect on weight? For example, if the diabetic patient is thin and if a diabetic patient is obese or overweight, then the option might change. What is the risk of hypoglycemia? A patient is a driver, a patient is a lone resident, a patient is an elderly bedridden. So you need to address the fact of a risk of hypoglycemia. What is the existing comorbidity? Like if the patient already having an atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or at risk of having a major cardiovascular event, a patient is a case of CKD or any other organ involvement. And the cost is the major factor being in India and the patient preference. And lastly, this long-term CB outcome, this was included in the recent uh, era. Although I'm not a big fan of this uh, CB outcomes, but uh, nowadays, if any diabetic drug has to be approved, it has to clear the CV outcome. So <clears throat> at least the first eight factors are very, very important. Like you cannot start a low efficacious drug for a severe hyperglycemia. Safety is very, very important. Side effects is very, very important. Effect on weight, I would say many of the pay physicians and the diabeticians usually neglect while treating. I have seen many obese patients initially starting with sulfonylureas and later gaining weight. A very thin built patient was given dabagliflozin. So these do occur in the medical practice. <clears throat> then the risk of hypoglycemia, as I told you, in a particular set, existing comorbidity and the cost. And always give the patient preference, always give him a choice, give him a nice thali, let him choose what he wants is best, what suits him best, knowing all the things about the drug. So let's start the uh, very famous drug, or I would call this as a brightest star in the whole universe of an oral antidiabetic agent is the metformin. So metformin was a drug which was discovered almost uh, around uh, uh, 60, 70 years back. But the effect of this drug was unknown. So this drug, is the only drug which is occurring naturally in a plant called Galliga officinalis. The Galliga officinalis. If you remember the name, it might be the entrance question. It is also called as a French lilac. So this drug is nowadays extracted from this particular plant. And this is the only bigonide in current use. So, this is a bigonide, that means it is a combination of two molecules of gonadine. The hypoglycemic effect of gonadine was uh, known, uh, I think, 100 years back, but this bigonide came into existence only after 60 years back. So, the only bigonide which kept in medical use is the metformin. The other bigonides, like the penformin and the uh, buformin, the lost interest due to their extreme side effect profile in causing the lactic acidosis. <clears throat> so now coming to the cellular mechanism of actions of metformin, I would say the metformin is like the Kailasha Parvata, like many of the things are unknown with respect to the metformin. Uh, although scientists are trying daily in and out in finding out the exact mechanism of action, how this drug is uh, causing the uh, glycemic control in the diabetes, it appears to be a very pleiotropic effect through various mechanisms of action, especially at the molecular level. 
a subcellular level. Maybe it is acting on the mitochondria. Maybe it is acting on the ATP generation like this. It does not act on a single receptor. So it is a pleiotrophic effect. And nowadays, a lot and lot things are getting unleashed about the drug called metformin. So the cellular actions of metformin are multiple. And it is concentration dependent. What is this important means? If you expose a cell, for example, I would take this is a cell from an intestine. If you expose this cell to a very high concentrations of metformin, very high concentrations of metformin, what will this do is this will suppress the mitochondrial respiratory chain. So this mitochondrial respiratory chain is a chain which is important for the energy generation, important for the ATP production. So when this ATP production is hampered, this cell goes for an anaerobic me uh, metabolism in generating a huge lactate. So this is the mechanism how uh, increased concentration of metformin usually causes a lactic acidosis. So even presently, if you expose a particular cell, so a very high concentrations of metformin, it will generate a huge amount of lactate by converting itself from anaerobic metabolism into anaerobic metabolism because it will suppress the mitochondrial respiratory chain. And the actions of metformin appears to be both insulin dependent and the insulin independent. Although the actions of metformin are very best observed when the insulin is acting partly, at least partly in the body. <laughs> like a patient of an insulin resistance. Insulin is there, but insulin is not acting properly. It is acting partly. Then the metformin will act. But the metformin also acts in a diabetes through a variety of mechanism in which an insulin is not involved. So if you understand this, metformin exerts mainly, the clinical mainly effects on the intestines and liver and by muscle some action. I would say like this. <clears throat> so what does it do? The metformin in the intestine is it increases the anaerobic glucose metabolism in converting glucose into lactate rather than lactate to pyruvate and increases the glucose turnover. And the major mechanism of action is in the liver. So what it, it does is it reduces the hepatic glucose output by two mechanisms. One is by decreasing the uh, gluconeogenesis and by decreasing the uh, lysis of the glycogen, which is a stored uh, molecule containing many molecules of glucose. So in the muscle, it causes the shifting of the specific receptors GLUT into the surface. So there are GLUT receptors in the skeletal muscle. So this shifts these into the cellular wall so that the glucose is taken inside when the insulin comes. So this increases the insulin sensitivity in the skeletal muscle. And this also increases the insulin sensitivity in the liver. So by these two, since the mechanism of action is much more better in the liver compared to the skeletal muscle. So that's why the metformin is a drug which is a very important in reducing the fasting hepatic glucose output. We know that the major source of glucose when in a fasting state is the output from the glucose. That's why it mainly reduces the fasting blood sugar with a minimal action on the postprandial blood sugar. And if you see this uh, chart, this particular chart I have taken from the Holtz textbook of diabetes. So this also mentions that the diverse actions of the uh, metformin, along with the actions on the hyperglycemia, the insulin resistance, the drug tries to also act on the dyslipidemia and the procoagulant state and also the endothelial function. This has also been proven uh, in the CV outcome studies of the metformin also as a part of the post hoc analysis of the UKPDS, etc. They have all uh, stated that the metformin is cardiovascularly stable. It exerts its anti-atherogenic action independent from the action on the diabetes. So there are many actions of the diabetes. Uh, uh, many actions of the metformin on diabetes. So this is a, a molecular basis how this drug is suppresses the glucogenesis mainly by suppressing this enzyme. This is called as glycerol phosphate 
dehydrogenase of a mitochondrial variety that is MGPD. So ultimately <laughs> altering the concentration of the lactate to pyruvate and the NADH to NAD. So this will increase the lactate. This lactate comes to the blood picture causing the lactic acidosis and the pyruvate concentration falls down, hence reducing the glucose output from the liver. So this is how the drug mainly acts in the liver. So if you want to know the clinical things, uh, the metformin is a drug which is in use since many years. So this is a drug which comes in two forms, either an immediate release form or an extended release form. The extended release form is the major which we use clinically. Uh, the drug as a standard should be taken with meals or immediately before each meal. The starting dose is 500 milligrams or sometimes an 850 milligram. And the dosage has to be taken to its an optimal dosage to attain a maximum blood glucose control. So you need to take the maximum blood glucose control. For example, if you start the drug at 500 mg OD, go on increasing it to maximum dose till the patient observes the side effects. The dose at which the patient develops side effects takes the dose which was previous to the dose which caused the side effects. This is a very, very important thing as far as all OADs is concerned. Don't just stay with the spine at MG OD dosage. You need to take this to the maximum dosage to have a maximum effect over a period of time. I have seen many of the patients uh, receiving 500 mg of metformin and staying on the 500 mg metformin, that is a very wrong practice. You need to take it to the optimal dosage to achieve the maximum blood glucose control. <laughs> so many countries now have the uh, the XR, SR or ER, like the extended release, sustained release or uh, an extended release. All these are same. So these are available in the most countries. So the advantage of this is they can be given at a OD dosage. And they can be either given in the evening or in the morning. So if you want to see the maximum dosage here, uh, it is from 2.5 gram to 3 gram. The European countries approve till 3 gram, but the American countries, the FDA approves it till 2.5 gram. So this is the maximum dosage you can take. You should remember the maximum dosage. This will be asked in the exams and even in the Viva OC. And if you want to know the efficacy of the drug, the drug is a modestly efficacious drug. It will reduce the fasting plasma glucose by 50 to 90 milligram per deciliter with the corresponding HbA1c up to uh, 1%. And the adverse effects, the drug which is uh, very important in causing the GI intolerance and the diarrhea. So many of the patients usually uh, get to see the side effects when you start it initially or especially when you increase the dose compared to the previous dose. But 10% of patients will never tolerate metformin. You should remember this at any dosage. So even a 250 milligram of metformin may, may cause them a severe uh, diarrhea or severe bloating sensation which the patient are very, very uncomfortable with. So a 10% patients, you need to shift a class from a different class. Now, the another important side effect is the vitamin B12 deficiency, mainly by altering or decreasing the absorption of the intrinsic factor and the cobalamin complex at the level of ileum. So by decreasing the absorption, it will cause the uh, vitamin B12 deficiency. Hence, a patient is advised to monitor for vitamin B12 levels every yearly. Especially if the patient is having the, uh, uh, the pure vegetarians or the malabsorption or any other risk factors for that person. So you need to be very, very careful with the vitamin B12 deficiency. Or some doctors usually... Uh, prefer giving the uh, intramuscular dosage of the uh, vitamin B12 preparation at each visit or many of the doctors uh, tries to give every monthly injection to the diabetics who receive metformin irrespective of their vitamin B12 status. 
But the ideal thing is to monitor the B12 levels. When they go below the recommended level, you need to start the supplementation uh, to prevent the development of symptoms, particular to this. And the lactic acidosis is not observed at the dose which you use clinically in a very stable patient. <clears throat> but a very high concentrations of metformin can cause lactic acidosis of the patient ingests a tetrotoxic dosage, or when the patient is in the stage of an organ dysfunction, like a patient of a severe renal failure where the metformin excretion is altered, a patient of cardiac failure, the liver failure, and the patient is in over shock. The metformin at a dosage which is used in clinically can cause a dangerous lactic acidosis. That's why when the patient is admitted to the hospital, we usually don't give metformin, especially if the patient is having critical issue. <laughs> uh, in, the patient, in the ICU, don't give metformin. When the patient is having dengue shock syndrome, don't give metformin respective. So you need to be very careful when choosing the drug in the IPD setting. You know, the difference between what is the immediate release and the extended release tablet is, we know that metformin's action is insulin dependent. And the metformin suppresses the hepatic glucose output, but not to a level to cause hypoglycemia. But what happens is if we give the immediate release tablet, sometimes the concentration moves out of therapeutic dosage. So we will have a peak effect sometimes crossing the therapeutic range, increasing the patients at risk of hypoglycemia and lactic acidosis, both. So this is also called as peak dose hypoglycemia. So this is usually seen with the immediate release tablet. <clears throat> and sometimes the concentration is below therapeutic range and observing hyperglycemia. So the glycemic variability appears to be very high with the immediate release tablet. So this issue is completely addressed with a tablet in the form of an extended release tablet. So this stays within the therapeutic zone, does not cause a peak dose hypoglycemia and the glycemic variability is not too much. So uh, you will see n number of patient reports having an hypoglycemia on only metformin. So please see to uh, that the patient is not receiving the immediate release tablet, but receiving the extended release tablet. So this is a very important thing to remember here. So if you want to know the efficacy, as I told you, it is moderately efficacious. It reduces uh, the uh, fasting glucose by four to eight millimoles or 36 to 78 and HbA1c by up to 1%. So this was a case article, uh, if you want to read, you can read in the NEGM, which is present. So here they have described a patient who was a woman, uh, middle-aged woman with a type 2 diabetes, mellitus was admitted because of the hospital uh, in the abdominal pain, vomiting and confusion. And the initial laboratory showed the serum lactate level of 20 and venous blood pH of an acidosis. So this was a case report of the MALA, that is metformin-associated lactic acidosis, a very nice case to be known by all the physicians, which is described in the NEGM. I have given the dates. And as I told you that metformin is a drug which has got uh, a lot in the in its uh, bag, like it is only approved to treat type 2 diabetes mellitus, but now we already know that the drug can be used for pre-diabetes the drugs is being used in type 2, type 1 diabetes mellitus patient, especially patient is very well controlled on insulin and developing obesity for a period of time. And the GDM, it is the drug approved in the uh, European societies. The PCOs, that is the polycystic ovarian disease, when you start them on metformin, the annulatory phase usually goes on. They start menstruating. This is a wonderful effect on the metformin, although it is not approved, but we usually use in PCO. And in FLD, again, uh, it's moderate effect on weight. By causing weight loss, it has appeared to be uh, good in NFLD. Now we have gotten investigations for new applications, especially the thing which has already advanced is the anti-aging. We know that nowadays only two things have been proven to address the aging issue. One is the calorie restriction. Another one is the metformin. These are the only two 
things which have shown the beneficial effects to prevent the age. I think this is mentioned in the Harrison. You can go and study. The metformin is are currently under the investigation for the cancer. A very interesting issue is the nephro protection. Although the data is very unclear, the cardio protection, as I told you, the metformin has the pleiotropic effect in addressing the endothelial abnormalities and the lipid abnormalities can have a good cardio protective action. And this is another new thing which can be asked in the entrance question tissue which retains the maximum concentration of an ingested metformin. So this is a very recent study uh, that I think in 2022, what they did was they segregated the patients who are receiving metformin and who are not receiving metformin. And they give both the patient the FDG, you know that this is a fluorodeoxy glucose that is a non-metabolizable glucose to know the tissue uh, functioning. So what they observed was in a patient who was receiving metformin, the maximum concentration was seen in the colon, especially terminal to the ileum. So the metformin appears to have a huge effect, effect on the intestine in reducing the blood glucose and it is at complete, not completely understood whether it is due to its effect on the glucose output or its effect on the, <clears throat> the intestinal microbiota. So uh, the question already appeared in the interest, uh, entrance exam, I think, uh, two years back, the drug which appears to have a beneficial effect on intestinal microbiota or the drug which acts through the alteration of the microbiota, the option was thiazolidine EDOs, the glycolyzide, the metformin, and the dapagliflozin. And the answer is metformin. So drug appears to have a huge effect on the uh, intestinal microbiota. So the answer is intestine. The drug which retains the maximum concentration of an ingested metformin appears to be intestine, to be specifically a colon. So this is things about the metformin. I think uh, you all understood the metformin. Let me know if there are any doubts. Let's move to the sulfonylureas. The next uh, famous and a very strong category of class in the management of the sulfonylureas. We need to find a way for the sulfonylureas in the era of the new drugs, especially the GLP-1, the DP-4, and the SGLT-2 inhibitors. So the first report of hypoglycemic activity of the sulfonylurea was uh, reported way back to the 1937. <laughs> so these drugs were structurally similar to the sulfonamides. So it was known that the patients who were receiving sulfonamides were going into hypoglycemia. So this side effect meant in the diagnosis of the, uh, sorry, in the discovery of sulfonylurea and identifying the mechanism of action of these drugs. Earlier, the first generation sulfonylureas were used in 1950s. These drugs were chlorpropamide, tolbutamide, etc. These were a very, very long acting sulfonylureas were very dangerous drugs in causing hypoglycemia and they are not cardiovascular safe also. Now, after around uh, three uh, decades, the new generation of sulfonylureas came into existence. These were mainly the glybenclamide and the glipizide then after 1995, the third generations got approved, that is the glimepiride and the glycolazide, especially the extended release version. <laughs> so the sulfonylureas are classified mainly based on the either their generations. They can be the first generation, they can be the second generation, third generation, and they can also be classified on the mechanism of action or the uh, duration of action, like short acting, long acting, etc. You can go to any pharma textbooks to uh, understand these mechanisms. Now, to know the mechanism of action is very, very important as far as sulfonylureas are concerned. So sulfonylureas are what? So they are potassium channel blockers. So 
So this is a very, very important, a straightforward and a straightforward question has also been asked in the entrance also. The glimeparide acts by opening the calcium channel, closing the calcium channel, opening the potassium channel, closing the potassium channel. So this is what this was the question which was asked multiple times. And sometimes the uh, confusion appears in the exam, whether they open it or close the it. So they are potassium channel blockers. So where do they act? They act on the potassium channel in the beta cells of pancreas. So there are a specific type of potassium channel present in the beta cells of pancreas. These are called as ATP sensitive potassium channels. So these are ATP sensitive. And this particular channel is made by two segments. One is a central, centrally existing channel, which uh, alters the movement of the potassium ion uh, from the intracellular compartment to the extracellular compartment, also called as KIR 6.2. And this has got a surrounding domain called sulfonylurea receptor, which, have got a, which has got a specific binding site to the sulfonylurea. So the type of sulfonylurea receptor present in the beta cell is called as sulfonylurea receptor type 1. And the potassium channel is KIR 6.2. So this is a very, very important gene, the KIR 6.2 is the same gene which gets mutated in a patient of neonatal diabetes. And the drug of choice for this is the glyvinclomide. This is a, a form of a monogenic diabetes. So in which the K6.2 channel gets mutated the gene involved is ABCC8. This is responsible for the neonatal diabetes mellitus. What is neonatal diabetes mellitus? A diabetes which appears in six less than six months after the birth. <clears throat> so this is to know about the uh, CARE 6.2 and the uh, SIR1. So SIR1 is present in the beta cells of the pancreas and which has got a specific binding site for the sulfonyl ureas. And sulfonyl ureas after binding to their site what they do is they close this potassium channel. So this will cause the intracellular potassium ion to increase, causing a membrane depolarization. So the voltage gets altered, causing a stimulation of these calcium channels called as voltage-derived calcium channels or also called as voltage-gated calcium channels. So the change in the voltage by membrane depolarization opens the calcium channel. So this causes an influx of calcium, causing an increased intracellular calcium. So this increased intracellular calcium downregulates through the protein uh, multiple mechanism of action, causing the exocytosis of the insulin granules. Remember, there are already some stored granules. If there are stored granules, they directly come and attach, and this will release the insulin. This is called as first phase insulin release. And this will also cause us a downgrade movement to secrete and to uh, start synthesizing more and more insulin and secreting, which is called a second phase, which takes around 10 minutes. So the first phase and the second phase, both insulin secretion increases after the addition of sulfonylurea. So the drugs which are currently used are the glybenclamide, the glimepiride, the glycoside, and the glipizide. <coughs> The earlier there was a controversy uh, because of their extra pancreatic effect. As I told you, there is sort of one receptor which is present in the pancreas. If there is one, there has to be two and three. So there is no three. We have sir two, that is sulfonylurea receptor 2A and 2B. So this 2A is present in cardiac muscle, this 2B present in the vascular endothelium. So this cardiac sulfonylurea channel 2A, uh, this was known to many scientists, I think around 20, 30 years back. So they extrapolated that the sulfonylurea when you give not only act on the SIR1, but they also appear to act on SIR2. So what is their mechanism of action when they uh, particularly stimulate this particular receptor? So then the controversy existed whether do they affect the cardiac ischemic preconditioning because they are altering the potassium channel. So we know what is a preconditioning here. <clears throat> Whenever we have the aortic coronary occlusion, 
uh, it will cause an uh, infarct. Uh, whenever this uh, microvascular infarcts occur repeatedly, the myocardial muscles go into preconditioning wherein they are constantly exposed to a very low concentration of blood flow, which will make them very stable when the actual MI comes. So this is called as an ischemic preconditioning. So the myocardial cells are preconditioned for the ischemia, the coming ischemia. So what the theoretically they concluded was the sulfonylureas may attenuate this ischemic preconditioning so that the heart will not be ready when the actual infarct comes ultimately increasing the size of the impact. So this was the proposed abnormality with sulfonylureas, but later on they found that uh, only the old age or the first generation or the second generation of PSP have some effect, but the new generation, the, especially the glimepiride and the glyclozide, usually does not have any effect altering the ischemic preconditioning. Nowadays it's been considered as very safe to use both glimepiride and glyclozide and they have been proven the cardiovascular safe also. So if you want to know the pharmacokinetics a little here, the glybenclamide, which is also called as a gliburide in USA, both are same, don't get confused with the names. The gliburized is just a micronized formulation of the glybenclamide. The gliburide is not available in India, it's available as a glybenclamide, which is the very cheap, a drug uh, as far as sulfonylureas is concerned and it is long acting so it has a higher risk of hypoglycemia and you have to avoid this drug in elderly patients and in a patient with renal failure. Now coming to the glimepiride, the dose is used is 1 to 6 mg, the maximum dose is 8 mg. Again the long acting drug but with a very rapid mechanism of action, a drug with a very low uh, I think lesser weight gain compared to all the drugs. The average weight gain with the sulfonylureas is 3.5 kg in the first three months. Then it stabilizes. How do you remember this 3.5 kg? This is the same weight gain which is ideal for any pregnant woman in pregnancy. So the pregnancy uh, weight gain if crosses 3.5 kg, it increases the risk of GDM. So that's why I, had, I remember it like this, even the uh, amount of weight gain caused by the sulfonylureas is 3.5 kg, around 3.5 kg. And the glimepiride among the sulfonylureas causes the uh, lesser weight gain. And as I told you, this does not have any effect on SIR2A. The ischemic preconditioning effect is not to be <laughs> feared off with the glimepiride. The glyclozide has largely replaced with the extended release a 30 mg of extended release is equivalent to 80 mg of immediate release. See the dose difference here. But the difference is price, it is very costly, the extended release. <clears throat> so again, a glyclozide is a good drug with the lowest weight gain, like the glimepiride, and a lesser hypoglycemia, a drug with the lowest incidence of hypoglycemia, both proven uh, as an evidence-based is also glyclozide and we use a single dosage and the drug which has got an independent favorable effect on the thrombogenesis by their influence on platelet aggregation and fibrinolysis. So this can be the entrance question, the sulfonylurea which act on the platelet aggregation and the fibrinolysis is the glyclozide. So shortest acting is the glipizide. And another thing which you want to uh, remember about glipizide is used in mild to moderate renal failure. So if you want to use a sulfonylurea in a renal failure patient, the glipizide is best. Uh, maybe you need to give it in divided doses like uh, 2.5 mg starting with BD or DID, but it is safe comparable to all the drugs in kidney failure. So there is each thing to be known uh, with each sulfonylureas. <laughs> I think I have mentioned all the important things here. And you should also know the dose adjustment protocol. As with any OADs, I have told you in the recent uh, uh, time that you have to take it to their optimum dosage. You just cannot start a dose and remind them. Like a glimepiride, a very commonly used drug, I will say, start with 1 mg the first week and every three weeks you go on increasing the dosage. Go for 2, go for 3, go for 4 and you need to achieve the maximum dosage provided there are no side effects. So the clinically effective doses are usually half the maximum doses. So maximum dose is 8 mg. So the best clinical dose is usually 
four mg of glimepiride and allow at least two weeks for the drug action before increasing doses further. And please instruct the patient not to take this drug if you are skipping the meal. And proper meal timings needs to be maintained to avoid hypoglycemia. So you cannot give this drugs to uh, the patient population in which the meal pattern is very haphazard, like drivers, the politicians, <laughs> the business class. So all these drugs where the meal pattern is very haphazard, it's usually better to avoid sulfonylureas, which will cause a dangerous hypoglycemia. Uh, I'm telling you that hypoglycemia is not a very simple thing. Hypoglycemia is a very, very, very frightening experience. So please address sulfonylurea as uh, uh, causing hypoglycemia when your patient tells you the symptoms. And uh, along with the hypoglycemia, you need to be very careful about the weight gain that they're causing. As I told you, the average weight gain is around 3.5 to 4 kilo. And it usually stabilizes after three to six months. And there are some uncommon side effects as these are sulfur-based drugs. Sometimes they may cause an anaphylaxis that you should be knowing of. So uh, there is something called the sulfonylurea failure, which is very common nowadays. The primary sulfonylurea is at the onset. At the right onset, the patient will not respond to the sulfonylurea. So the failure to show any significant reduction in glycemia after starting the drug for the first time is called as primary sulfonylurea, which is usually seen in 5 to 10% of type 2 diabetes mellitus. So as soon as they get diagnosed, if you start them on the glimepiride, they may not respond because of beta cell uh, failure. The reason is the gross beta cell failure because they act on the beta cell. If the beta cell itself is not there to secrete the insulin, how they are going to increase the insulin secretion. And this is particularly observed in thin diabetics. Like if you get a patient who is around 40 year old, whose BMI is only 18, coming with the features of type 2 diabetes, or you are labeled him as type 2 diabetes and you are ruled out hybrid forms that he is not the LADA and he is not the APD. Then also, 5 to 10 percent of patients may not respond to sulfonylurea. That is what is primary sulfonylurea failure. And the secondary sulfonylurea failure, the number you need to re uh, remember here is 5 to 10. Again, every year, around five patients with diabetes stop responding to sulfonylurea therapy due to decreasing beta cell function. So that's why I'm telling you the initial management is with the OAD. Later on, they may, uh, they may need the insulin over a period of time. So that's why the point of beta cell preservation has become a very, very important nowadays. A must address fact. You need to know the drug class. What is their effect on the beta cell preservation? Whether they, whether, whether they preserve the beta cell, whether they cause the loss of the beta cell. So the sulfonylurea does not have any beta cell preservation action. Please remember this. So what is the current positioning of this sulfonylurea in clinical practice? Why this question exists? Because we know that they cause us weight gain, they may cause secondary failure, they, they are not beta cell supportive. So why do why we want to use a sulfonylurea? One is because they are highly efficacious. They are next to insulin in reducing the uh, glycemic load. And another issue is their cost. They are comparably cheaper than other classes of drugs. So if you see this ADA uh, recent update, see where the sulfonylurea is there. <clears throat> Let's find out where the sulfonylurea is there. I think there is only one. So the present ADA advises the first line therapy as metformin with a, a lifestyle modification. If the patient is not responding to that, in a patient who is not having any established C, uh, atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or CKD, and in whom the cost is the major issue, in them only you are starting the sulfonylurea. Otherwise, in a patient who is ACVD predominant, in CKD predominant, in which the cost is not the issue, none of them, the second agent is the sulfonylurea. That's why the sulfonylurea, they are telling that. Uh, it is uh, losing the pop popularity, etc. Nowadays, a lot of the pharma companies are 
uh, revisiting the drugs. They try to uh, motivate to write sulfonylurea lot and lot. But the, if the cost is the major issue, then sulfonylurea is a wonder drug. But you need to address the side effect profile uh, very properly. And again, this is uh, AAC guidelines. If you see here, uh, the sulfonylureas are, I think, last options in all the category, even with a the monotherapy, with a the dual therapy, with a the triple therapy, in anything, the sulfonylureas have taken the last position. Next, coming to the megalitinides. So these megalitinides are also uh, the insulin releasers, but they are short acting and they're also called as prandial insulin releasers. They are very similar to sulfonylureas, except that they bind to a non-sulfonylurea receptor. So their binding site on the receptor site is different from where the sulfonylurea bind. So they're also called as non-sulfonylurea secretogogues. They act on the non-sulfonylurea receptor on the beta cells and hence increase the insulin secretion. From this particular point, everything is similar compared to the sulfonylurea. But another difference is they are very short acting. So they are having a quicker attachment and earlier detachment. So that's why they are called as a prandial insulin releasers. Because they cause very rapid and a very brief increase in the insulin, they are usually used to manage a postprandial hyperglycemia with a very minimal effect on the fasting blood glucose, and they have to be taken with a meal. There are two drugs which are available in the uh, present class. One is the rapaglinide, another one is the nataglinide. I don't know how many people are you are using these two drugs. I am presently using rapaglinide. Uh, in a suitable popularity. Nataglinide I am not using because of the availability and the cost issue. <laughs> so the useful situation for the megalitinides is very, very important in which there are elderly patients in whom hypoglycemia is a major concern in sulfonylurea and in which the postprandial uh, sugars are not controlled and the meal pattern is haphazard. So for example, if there is a, uh, I will give the example of a driver, he is a diabetic. And his meal pattern is very, very haphazard. Sometimes he takes his lunch at 1 p.m., sometimes at 4 p.m. So what you can do with the megalitonide is, megalitonide is a meal drug. So whenever he takes meals, just he takes the tablet, then he takes the meal. So this will control the postprandial surge occurring in this due to the shorter action. Similarly, in a patient who is liver failure, the nataglinide is very much safe in even child pug B and C, so nataglinide we can be used in the renal failure. And even in a kidney failure patient, you can use it for management. Patients with irregular meal patterns, like who are doing fast, the policemen, the politicians, and the Ramadan period, etc. And patient who is a specifically uncontrolled postprandial sugars. His fasting is controlled, his A1C is controlled, but prandials are not controlled. So you can try adding this particular drug or the alpha glucosidase inhibitors for that matter. So we have got a limited usage. Uh, the problem with these drug is multiple dosaging. Like each meal you have to take this one single drug. That's when nataglinide becomes costly. It is around uh, eight to nine rupees per tablet. So if you want to give it three times per day, then it will become difficult. So rapaglinide is two to three rupees. So it is possible. Now coming to thiazolidinidions are also called as glitazones. So glitazones are the uh, PPR gamma agonist. PPR means the peroxisome proliferative activated receptors. So these receptors are nuclear based receptors. So this is how they act. When you give a thiazolidinidions, they act on this PPAR uh, receptor. So this is a PPAR receptor when stimulated with the thiazolidinidions, it binds to a particular segment called retinoid X receptor. So this PPAR and the retinoid X receptor complex stimulates a particular segment to transcribe many of the downgrade proteins. 
So what these proteins and the genes do is they <clears throat> are especially important in the adipogenesis. So there is a neoadipogenesis occurring on stimulation of these drugs, causing the adipocyte differentiation. So this small newly forms adipose tissue <clears throat> is very much sensitive to insulin. So they act on the insulin resistance. So this is how the drug acts. Uh, the only drug which is presently is in the use is the pyroclitazone. Again, a very good drug with a modest efficacy. Uh, to go for the molecular level of action on the PPER activation, there is an increased secretion of an adiponectin and decreased secretion of the free fatty acids, the resistin and MCP protein, ultimately acting on the liver to reduce the glucose output, increasing the fatty acid oxidation, causing the lipid accumulation so that the uh, insulin resistance in the liver decreases and in the muscle, it increases the glucose uptake and lipid accumulation. So this lipid accumulation due to redistribution. Redistribution of the adipose tissue is very, very important in the pyoglitazone group. So to understand this, this actually causes something called as a lipid steel phenomena. So after stimulating this PPER gamma, so this PPER gamma basically regulates how the fatty acid is stored and how the glucose is metabolized. So if you stimulate this, what it does is first it reduces the glucose production in the liver to some extent. Along with this drug, this increases the peripheral uptake of the glucose by the uh, skeletal muscle and the adipose tissue. It stimulates the lipogenesis in the adipose tissue and it increases the GLUT4 transport in the adipose tissue. So this will ultimately causing the uh, decreased circulating fatty acid level concentration, reducing the intrahepatic visceral fat and the insulin sensitivity increase. So this will cause a reduction in the blood sugar, reduction in the HDL and a beneficial effect of reduction in the triglyceride. So these drugs act when there is an insulin resistance. If there is no insulin resistance, the patient is very thin, as already in Indians, may not act very well. So because of this, the drugs which increases the fatty acid storage in the subcutaneous adipose tissue results in the lipid steel phenomena in which the circulating uh, fatty acids uh, and the reduced concentration of triglyceride in the muscle and the liver. So it basically shifts your fat which is there in the liver into the subcutaneous adipose tissue, uh, increasing the sensitivity of the liver to the insulin. Again, the drug uh, dosage protocol is start at the 15 mg and take up to at least 30 mg, the maximum dosage of 45 mg. <clears throat> So drug can be used alone or in combination with metformin, sulfonylurea or insulin. When you use thiazolidinidiones with insulin, there are two effects. One is good, one is bad. The good effect is it usually reduces the insulin dosage and it increases the chance of peripheral edema. You need to address both the issues when you combine this with insulin. And the thiazolidinidiones, as I told you, it causes the lipid redistribution. So it does not cause the maximum possible effect till six weeks. So it takes time. That's why remember, it is week one, it is week eight, and it is week 16. So you need to wait for at least six weeks, one and a half months to act the thiazolidinidiones. And maximum effect, if you actually want to see it, is only seen after six months. This is because, as I told you, the drug's effect on the adipose tissue metabolism and this distribution uh, is usually takes time of around three to four months. So always follow when you start patient on the thiazolidin ions, especially for three to four months before any increase in the dosage. The therapeutic application, as I told you, it can be given as a single dosage or a twice daily dosage, can be used as a monotherapy or uh, the combination therapy. The clinically effective doses are maximum doses. You need to address the symptoms of fluid overload like the effort intolerance and the pedal edema, especially the patients of heart failure. And you need not monitor the liver enzymes regularly in this. So the contraindication in the class 2, 3, 4 and ischemic heart disease due to the possible an acute exacerbation or the acute decompensation to be specific. And any volume related states, maybe CKD, maybe nephrotic syndrome, you need to be very, very careful. A frank hepatitis don't start with thiazolidinidiones. 
Uh, this is a very, very important and many patients usually uh, forget this many physicians, the macular edema presenting the clinically significant macular edema is very, very important. It's a contraindication for the thalsorotin edemas because as I told you, this is a drug which causes fluid overload. If the edema might worsen and may cause the uh, increase in the blindness. So whenever the patient uh, comes to you and tells you that he is having a reduced vision in some eye, and the patient is recently operated for cataract and does not have any proliferative diabetic retinopathy, you need to be suspecting the clinically significant macular edema. So what I would say is many of the uh, physicians may not be uh, seeing the fundus regularly. It's a very bad habit, obviously, but if at all, clinically, the judgment is very, very important, especially if the patient is Telling that his uh, vision is affected, at least get him checked for the macular edema before starting thyroid deals. And thyroid ophthalmopathy, you need to be very, very careful as many of the patients have the coexisting thyrotoxicosis. And osteoporosis is one thing. The diabetes and the osteoporosis is a different and a big issue nowadays. The bladder cancer, although it is a Contraindication for a bladder cancer, but the thyroidine idioms is a causative agent in causing bladder cancer is controversial nowadays. Precaution is cannot be given in pregnancy, and if any time, three times elevation of liver enzymes, you need to be stop the drug. And any massive fluid retention, ankle edema, and severe weight gain, you, you should be very precautious in these patients. So, what are the points in favor of thyroidine idioms? Is it is very inexpensive? A single daily dosage is possible. It efficacy is good. There's no hypoglycemia. It can be combined with any OED. It also has a beta cell preservation and the durability effect, favorable effect on lipid profile. It is a beneficial effect on the uh, CV outcome and which has been proven in the proactive studies also, but not favorable effects are some like weight gain, the fluid retention in edema, risk of osteoporosis and the postmenopausal fractures and controls associated with the risk of bladder cancer. So the health ministry bans popular diabetes drug pyoglitazone along with analgin and d -exit. So this was the uh, media news in, I think, uh, the 2013 May. In May, government of India bans the pyoglitazone due to its effect on the causing the uh, bladder cancer. But later on, within the three-month period, in the month of July, it revoked the suspension of pyoglitazone so what came in between these two is a very important proactive study as far as pyoglitazone is concerned. So this study revealed that the risk of bladder cancer is not too much with the thyroid radians. But this study also gave us the new insights in increasing the risk of osteoporosis also. So this study made the government to revoke the suspension of pyoglitazone. Although long-term safety has been proven that it is good, it is safe for the, both the CV and the bladder cancer patient. But you need to be careful if the patient is having a pre-malignant condition of the bladder, especially who is having a recurrent UTI, some old tuberculous bladder. I would definitely not want to start the drug thyroid use. And the last class drug today will be the alpha glucosidase inhibitors. Uh, these drugs are... Uh, <clears throat> drugs which act on the enzyme called as an alpha glucosidase. So this uh, enzyme converts the polysaccharide and the oligosaccharides into monosaccharides. So this is how they act. So where is this enzyme situated? This is situated in the brush border microvilli. So this is one brush border. So this is brush border having the microvilli. So on this microvilli, the enzyme is secret, uh, situated, that is alpha glucosidase. So this enzyme converts the complex carbohydrates into simple carbohydrates. So this is how uh, these drugs act. Uh, so if you see, if, you, if you're not giving the acarbose, many of the glucose in the intestine is getting absorbed. But if you give the acarbose, the conversion of complex carbohydrate to the simple carbohydrate is not occurring. That's why the complex carbohydrates cannot be absorbed from the intestine. So they ultimately travel to the downstream pathway. 
one important thing here is uh, to remember here, uh, very, very important in, in fact. So these drugs, alpha glucosidase drugs, only act when you are taking carbohydrates in your meal. If you are not taking too much complex carbohydrates, if you're actually directly taking glucose, this drug is not acting. If you're taking only complex carbohydrates, uh, these drugs will help to some benefit. We know there are three drugs. The one is acarbose, the miglitol, and the oglibose. There are uh, these drugs act preferentially on different polysaccharides. Some may act better on the suprase or sucrose. Some may act better on the galactose, etc. So uh, that's why these drugs have a, a different uh, aspect of the mechanism. So this is an intrinsic, interesting question here. This might appear or not appear till now. Uh, which OAD or oral anti-diabetic agent is used in the treatment of a type of hypoglycemia? The metformin, the cetagliptin, acarbose, and dapagliflozin. So all these are drugs used for the diabetes. So the question asked here is, which among these is usually used to treat a type of hypoglycemia? The answer is again acarbose. And the type of hypoglycemia in which it is used is a reactive hypoglycemia. So uh, what is reactive hypoglycemia here is, it is also called as post-randial hyperglycemia. So this can be seen in both diabetics and non-diabetics. So what is this is when a patient takes meal, after the meal, the insulin secretion is very tremendous. It is not uh, depending on the amount of glucose, but a, uh, uh, only a mi minor amount of uh, the glucose ingestion or meal ingestion will stimulate a disproportionate increase in the insulin secretion from the beta cell of the pancreas can cause the postprandial hypoglycemia. So by giving a carbose, what you're doing is you're delaying the glucose absorption so that the sudden stimulation of the insulin is prevented. That's how these drugs act in the treatment of hypoglycemia. <laughs> So as I told you, three drugs are available in the market, the acarbose, the oglibose, and miglitol. I am not using acarbose and miglitol till now. I'm using the uh, oglibose only. So available as 0 0.2 and 0 0.3 dosage. Uh, you should know that it must be ingested with the first bite of each meal. When the meal comes in the intestine, the drug has to be there. You cannot take it after meal. <clears throat> so that's why the combinations containing the oglibose usually should not be used. Like if you are using a combination of metformin plus glimepiride plus oglibos, a very famous nowadays available. Metformin and glimepiride, it's okay to give after meals. But oglibos has to be taken before meal. So either ask the patient to take just immediately before the meal or give the oglibos separately. And as I told you, the drug is effective only if the diet contains at least 40 to 50 percent of carbohydrates that to the complex carbohydrates. <clears throat> the contraindication, we know that the uh, DK is a contraindication. If the patient having any intestinal abnormality, the patient having malabsorption, you cannot give this. If the IBD that is uh, inflammatory bowel disease and obstruction, perforation, you cannot give this. The side effects, we know that by delaying the glucose absorption, or the carbohydrate absorption, the carbohydrates are osmotically active, so they draw a lot of water and causes this abdominal bloating, discomfort, some diarrhea, and the flatulence. And the disadvantage is this is these drugs, even though they are moderately efficacious, they are expensive. And the frequent dosing and the poor complaints due to the GI side effects. Many of the patients may omit this drug due to the abnormal sensation. So to go to uh, part two, uh, this is a baseline that the FDA, which was provided in 2008, this FDA requirement for CV outcome studies for a new anti-diabetic agent. So what the drug gave in 2008 is any new drug, if it has to get an FDA approval for the diabetes mellitus, it has to clear the CV outcome studies. That means it should prove it should prove that the patient on a long term does not uh, does not alter your cardiovascular health. So all the new drugs have uh, 
nowadays which are getting approved are approved only after the cv outcome is proved so uh, thank you i will take the part 2 in the next coming uh, session